Now we're going to talk about inflationary finance or the temptation to use the printing press to raise revenues for the government, which is the second great challenge that has to be overcome in order to deliver a stable or price level or low inflation environment when we have a fiat money, uh, money off the gold standard. So, what's going to be in play here is basically two key things. There's going to be a model of the money market, and there's going to be a present value or intertemporal version of the government's budget constraint. So, the model of money market, there's going to be a, a, a supply of real balances. This is a supply of real balances, by which we mean nominal money divided by the price level. So the units of that are going to be goods. So this is going to be dollars, that's M, divided by the price level, which is dollars per unit good at time T. So if we take the ratio of those two, um, M over P is going to be have the units of goods at time T. That's what's on the left hand side. And the right hand side is a demand from it's a demand function. So this is supply and this is demand. And we've written down a classic demand function for money. Um, we say that the, the demand for real balances rises with the level of income or output. So if we double the size of the economy terms of output, we think we double the demand for real balances. It's basically going on. But the second argument here is the real interest rate, that's what the real interest rate is, plus, so that's, the key thing is R is a real interest rate. So it's goods at time T plus one. So, um, it's a rate of increase of goods. So one plus R, actually, the gross interest rate, is goods at T plus one divided by goods at T. So it's the rate of return on indexed securities in that rate. And pi TE is the expected rate of inflation. So this builds into theory that this is the nominal interest rate. It's the real rate of interest, the real rate of interest, that's real, um, and the expected rate of inflation. That's our theory. Okay, so, and and we think we think that the demand function, the demand for money, decreases for real balances decreases when nominal interest rates rise, and the reason is um, nominal interest rates are are the opportunity cost of holding money. Um, if you could, uh, when inflation is really high, um, the value of money erodes um, at, the rate of at the rate of inflation. So when people expect a lot of inflation, they, they flee cash and move into other securities and that drives, that drives the demand for real balances down. So that's what we're going to use. Okay, so that's our first equation. And then the second equation is the government budget constraint. And um, what's going to appear here is one of the same variables, R, which is going to be important for us. Um, and we're going to think of R basically as determined by the marginal productivity of capital, the, 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 the real productivity of real investments. So, so what this equation says is that um, this term right here, we're in an environment where there's no risk. We're doing this under perfect certainty or perfect foresight, if you will. Um, G is government expenditures. T is total tax collections. And what this term is, is this is the present value of the government, the government deficit. It's the present value of the government deficit. And what this is, this is the, um, 
This is the, the value of debt at time, at time one. And one plus R is the, the gross payments that you have to make. So, so this term is the, is, the, is the amount of money that you owe. So this whole left hand side is the present value um, of resources. That's the government deficit um, plus initial debt that the government somehow has to cover. Um, now in a model in which under the gold standard, and the gold standard, this has to be equal zero under the gold standard because the government can't print money under the gold standard. So that's equal to zero under the gold standard. And why? Because roughly speaking, um, this term is zero under the gold standard. The government doesn't print money. But we're gonna talk about episodes, or one of theory in which after 1914, the governments throughout the world left the gold standard in various stages. In which case, there's another source of revenue that can use, be used to cover the present. This is the present value of the deficit on the left side and side. This is the PV of the deficit. And somehow, the government's going to have to have a present value. So here's a present value here of something that's going to, that's going to cover that deficit. And what that something is going to be is money creation. The government's going to print money. Uh, at the end of the last period, money was this. It's going to print new money and it's going to spend it. And the real value of the resources it collects at T is it's dollars divided by the price level. And this is goods. These are real goods that are purchased by printing money. So if you or I had a printing press, it would be illegal. It would be counterfeiting. It's counterfeiting if private citizens do it. It's, uh, it's public finance if the government does it. But having a printing press allows you to raise revenues, and that's how much you raise. So the government budget constraint, taking into account that the government can print money between the treasury and the central bank can print money, is this. So we're going to use these two equations. We're going to work them pretty hard. Makes we're, the roadmap is we're going to make certain assumptions about what government expenditure is doing, what taxes are doing. We'll make some assumptions about the interest rate. Um, I'm sorry. Um, make some assumptions about the interest rate. Um, and we'll derive a theory of what pi TE is, expected inflation. And we're just going to, um, we're going to see what, what happens to the price level and expected inflation under various scenarios. That's where we're going to go. And in the course of this, we're going to get a sharp definition of what an open market policy is, an open market operation. And um, we'll study the analytics of inflationary finance, a very 20th century, and in some places still a 21st century topic. So I'm going to show you um, the poster children, some of the poster children um, for, for, um, for this theory. So the kind of theory we're talking about was actually invented in response to some striking observations. Um, and after, after World War I, a number of countries had hyperinflations. I'll tell you what the numbers were. In, in, in Germany, the prices rose essentially by a factor of 10 to the 12th. That's uh, between say 1921 and 19, end of 23. So it's a 12-digit inflation. In Austria, I think it was more like 10 to the seventh. Very, very rapid rates of inflation. Both Austria and Germany lost the war. And um, because of their fiscal situation, they, they, they ended up uh, printing a lot of money, um, currency. Uh, after the war to try to cover their expenditures. And um, it's, it's a very interesting thing to study, both of those instances. Um, but um, we're just going to go over this superficially, and I'm going to show you some data. Okay, so, um, so, th so and, and these data are from, a, these data that I'm getting are from a famous study of Philip Kagan. It's a 1956 study of uh, the monetary dynamics of hyperinflation. Uh, Philip Kagan. 
and I'm taking these graphs from, from Kagan because some of the most striking graphs in macroeconomics or any of the economics. So on the, um, this dotted line here, that's the, um, that's the real value. That's M over P. That's M over P. And um, it's on a, it's actually on a, um, if you'll notice, it's on a, um, it's on a, it's on a, a log scale over here. It's on a log scale. So what's happening is real balances, um, and the hyperinflation starts in 1921 and ends at the end of 23. Um, and, um, and, and what you'll notice is, um, so this scale is M over P, actually the log of M over P on the scale. And you'll notice what's happening is real balances are declining and they're declining, not quite monotonically. There's some interesting things that happen in the middle. The government's actually doing something here. So there's just joining, but the broad picture is real balances decline and they decline dramatically. Um, so um, despite the fact that M is increasing very fast, P is increasing even faster. That's the telltale sign of hyperinflation. M increases a lot and fuels the hyperinflation, but P rises even faster than M. And that's what, that's what this graph shows here. Okay. Now it ended suddenly, the hyperinflation ended in November, 1923. And that's an interesting story about why it ended. You can guess, the government stopped increasing the money supply. And for it to be able to do that, it had to make various adjustments. Um, that our theory is gonna be about. Now what's down here is the rate of change of prices. Now here's the scale. Again, it's a, um, look at this scale. Um, this is the rate of change of prices on a monthly level. It's monthly, um, monthly changes in prices. And, and what you see, it starts around zero. It's actually above zero. But it, in 21, it rises. In 22, it rises. I mean, these are high rates. These are 50% a month, 50% increase a month. And then some dr drastic events happen in 1923. Uh, the French government invades the Ruhr, takes care of it, takes over the Ruhr vet. Valley, um, and the German government starts printing money really fast. And then look what happens. Prices rise 200% a month, 300% a month. For, that's not per year, that's per month. So these are astronomical uh, rates of inflation. And as, as inflation rises, it's reasonable to say that expected, people knew what was happening, expected inflation rises too. And so this is our poster child um, M over P equals V. Y is not doing much relative to the other things. And then here's R plus pi T E. And remember this is a negative coefficient. So this graph is, is the poster child for, for uh, that negative effect. Um, that's Phillips Kagan's basic mechanism by which increase in money uh, that leads to expected inflation drives the real balances down. Okay, so Philip Kagan actually fit a graph. And what he did is he formed, he formed an estimate of the expected rate of inflation. And here's how he did it. He basically did it like this. He, he took a, he did the following. His model is like this. He took, he said it, it's not actually equal to actual inflation. It's, it's, a, um, it's a geometric moving average it's a geometric moving average of past rates of inflation. He's just gonna take past actual rates of inflation and weight them by some smoothing parameter, beta. Um, and um, these weights add up to one. And he formed this number for, for he, had a, he had a clever way of estimating beta. If you're a statistician, he estimated by maximum likelihood. And then he, what he plots here, he plots pi t e, his measure of pi t e here, Against the um, against a measure of m over p, and he uses a log scale there. He takes a log transformation, and what you'll notice is look where the li well, look where the points lie relative to this line. Um, until the very end of the hyperinflation, they lie right lie on that right in that line. Um, so this period, this is an astounding fit for an economic um, relationship, and it confirms. Kagan's basic uh, insight about the inverse relationship between 
expected inflation, which he's measured like this. And there's subsequent work showing that that's very close to a rational expectation of inflation. So um, forming expectations like that turned out to be a very wise forecasting rule if you were living in the hyperinflation. Uh, so this is a very good fit. Um, and um, th we have other graphs for Austria. And um, that's the fit, basically the same story. That's the fit that Kagan got for Austria. This is from Kagan's uh, paper. Okay, so I show you these data because those data are the uh, motivator and foundation of the theory of the demand function for money that, that we're going we're gonna to use throughout our theory, which is m over p equals this phi, this function. Uh, y, we're going to be talking about period where y is basically constant, and then r plus pi t e. This is all about pi t e. When, this, when, when pi t e in, increases, um, when pi t e increases, the demand for money goes down. That's what I mean by that negative sign. Okay, so now we're ready to do some, some analysis. Um, and this analysis is, um, okay, um, it's, you could think of it as old time religion. So what we're gonna get at is, is a theme. Um, the great economist John Maynard Keynes, who before he was a quote unquote Keynesian economist, he never said he was a Keynesian economist, he was a first rate classical economist. And he used this, he has this quote, which I wanna to read to you, I want you to read, which, um, which is at the heart of the theory uh, we're gonna be talking about. Um, he says, it is common to speak as though when a government pays its way by inflation, the people of the country avoid taxation. This is not so. What is raised by printing notes is just as much money taken from the public as is beer duty or an income tax. What a government spends, the public pays for. That's Keynes. There is no such thing as an uncovered deficit. That's Keynes. Never repealed that. But in some countries, it seems possible to please and content the public for at least a time by giving them in return for the taxes they pay finely engraved acknowledgements on watermarked paper. The income tax receipts, which we in England receive from the surveyor, we throw into the wastebasket. In Germany, they call them banknotes and put them in their pocketbooks, their wallets. In France, they are turbulents, bonds, and are locked up in the family safe. But they're all pieces of paper signifying the same thing. Keynes wrote this in 1924 in his tract on monetary reform. And he's trying to tell you that those things that look very different, taxes, printing money, and issuing bonds, he's saying in some ways they're the same thing. And he's challenging us to have, to, to, to see why they might be different. Okay. so. On the basis of this, so after World War I, uh, not only Germany, but other countries were experiencing uh, inflation problems. And um, one that was, uh, was, was France. Between, after, from 1922 on to 1926, France had recurrent problems uh, with inflation. Um, and um, Keynes uh, wrote about that, and he actually in his, in his book of essays called, it's collected in his book of essays, he has a uh, essay, his Essays in Persuasion it's called. He has an open letter to the French finance minister, which I put on these uh, slides. Um, and look what he says, an open letter to the French minister of finance, whoever he is or may be. And that's a, uh, a humorous reference to the fact that uh, the job of finance minister in France was so difficult that uh, people kept uh, being fired and resigning, and very many finance ministers. And so he wrote this article in 1926. 
Um, um, when France was struggling with high inflation and trying to find a way to stabilize. And I recommend reading this because he's, Keynes is re using exactly the same arithmetic that we're gonna be using today. And basically he said, he said, um, if you have inflation, uh, you basically have one way to stop it. You've got to stop printing money, but the only way you can stop printing money is you have to either raise government, uh, lower government expenditures, decrease taxes, um, I have dyslexia. You have to, if you want to stop printing as much money, you're going to have to cut government expenditures or raise taxes or default on your debt. Which is another way of defaulting on part of your debt so you can lower your interest expenses. That's what Keynes is saying. He wrote this, Keynes wrote beautifully. Um, so he wrote this letter. Uh, he's telling those principles to the French finance minister. He said there's no other way. There's no trick ways of doing it. So that's what he's writing. So he wrote this in 1923, 26, this beautiful letter. Talks about the principles. And um, okay, there it is. And um, he finally signs it, uh, your obedient servant, John Maynard Keynes. Okay. So um, just gonna fast forward. I, um, in, in the 1980s, um, I visited Brazil. Um, gave some talks, um, and Brazil was undergoing a very high inflation then. And various people asked me, um, well, what's the right analysis of this? And um, at the time, people were using um, all sorts of analysis, but they, they weren't using the principles in this letter by Keynes. So I, I, when people would ask me, I'd say, why don't you just go read, you know, they'd, they'd say, what, what would you say, Sergeant? And I'd say uh, about as analysis of inflation in Brazil, I'd say, well, go read Keynes's letter to the French finance minister, the same thing. Um, and um, finally somebody said, well, why don't you write something about that? Well, I couldn't just say, couldn't copy the letter, so I wrote my own letter. Um, so I wrote this letter. This is my um, open letter to the um, Brazilian finance minister. Um, and it's my, in my own words, but I say, um, exactly what Keynes said, kind of use modern, a little more modern language, but my message is exactly the same. If you're printing a lot of money, you got three choices. You can reduce government expenditures, you can increase taxes, or you can default on some of your debt. And whoever stabilizes, whenever you stabilize, it will be some mixture of those, th those three and only those three. So I did that and I signed it. This is a little pretentious, I signed it, your obedient service, Tom Sargent. And the only reason I did that was actually not to be pretentious, but say, actually, just go back and read Keynes because I've just repeated him. Okay, so that was a little fun for me, but there's some messages in here, which are in words, we're gonna use this, we're gonna use a little math to, uh, to describe what's going on in these words. Okay, and we're gonna go back to our two basic equations. And we might, uh, we might find some interesting things. So, so here's the government budget constraint um, that we have. Um, so, um, and there's, the key thing is there's a government budget constraint every period. Um, so what is the government budget constraint? GT, government expenditures, minus tax collections, plus, um, the interest payments on your uh, debt um, minus um, the new debt that you get uh, is going to be equal to, uh, you're going to have to cover it somehow and you're going to print money to cover the difference. Um, so this is T uh, minus T minus one for PT. And we're just going to write that for T equals zero, t equals one, and we, you can just keep doing that. There's one of those each period. Um, it's basically flow government budget constraint. Okay. So um, now what we're gonna do is, okay, so we're gonna use, now notice there's one for each period. Now, eco economists often use, and we used it in a previous lecture about credibility. We're going to use the term long run and short run. 
And I have to say what I mean by this, because with these sequences over here, um, we're kind of free to define long run and short run. They're vague terms. So I'm going to make them precise by telling you exactly what I mean by long run and short run. And we could do this in different ways, but we're going to do it in a way that allows us to focus, um, uh, to isolate some forces. Okay, so in the long run, um, I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that for t greater or equal to 1, uh, a bunch of stuff doesn't change. Um, so in particular, I'm going to assume government expenditure is constant at some level g. And this is for t greater than or equal to 1. Taxes are constant. The level of government debt's constant. Now, money is not going to be constant, but the rate of growth of money is constant. So this is key. The rate of growth, the growth rate of growth of money is 1 plus mu. So it's going to be constant for all t, greater than or equal to 1. And that's what I mean by long run. So by doing that, um, so I'm going to differentiate sharply between long run and short run. Short run is just stuff that goes on at time zero. So t equals zero, different stuff can go on. Um, so I just write the government budget constraint at time zero up here. But now, after having done this, I just have two, I have two government budget constraints, one that applies at t equals zero, and one that applies for all t's greater than or equal to 1. So when I say short run now, I mean t equals 0. When I say long run, I mean t greater than or equal to 1 and these conditions. OK, now I'm going to back up a little bit because we, we just did something. Um, when all this term is, all this stuff on the right is, this stuff on the right is mt minus mt minus 1 over pt. That's equal to this once I substitute this in. So if I do that, the rate of growth of, um, the rate of growth of, of money is equal to 1 plus mu. And the amount of, quote, real resources that are raised by printing money is equal to this. So this amount here turns out to be, and you can, just, just by doing a calculation, um, calculation is pretty easy to do. What do we do? We do, well, we've done it before. Um, we take mt uh, minus mt minus 1, I'll just start you on this, equals, um, well, let's see, it's going to be, um, it's going to be mt over pt minus m uh, t minus 1 over pt minus 1 times p um, t minus 1 over pt. Now, now, if money is growing, Uh, I won't do the whole thing, but if money is growing at that rate, um, then once real balances are are constant, prices are going to be growing at the same rate. If I just take that, once things settle down in this quote long run, um, if money is going up ten percent a year, price is going to go up ten percent a year. If I just use that substitute a lot of stuff in, I get this. That's it. So now, there's going to be something interesting here. Um, in particular, um, in particular, um, just come back. The, the left-hand side of this is the, um, the government deficit. That's the left-hand side here. And it consists of what the IMF calls the net of interest deficit or the primary deficit. The IMF would call this the primary deficit, which is the entire deficit except for interest service interest payments on the debt, which you have to service the debt. And they call the gross of interest deficit the net of interest deficit plus your interest payments. And what this what this what this equation says is the gross of interest deficit 
has to equal the revenue that you're raising from printing money. This is, uh, it's, it's got a fancy term nowadays, seniorage. It's the revenues you raise from printing money. That's what this is. So the gross of interest, the real gross of interest deficit has to be covered and it's covered by printing money. And actually in Argentina, um, there's an agreement between the central bank and the treasury on how much seniorage as a percentage of GDP they're gonna, they're gonna supply the treasury. And even after, even with the new government in Argentina, this is a big number. Okay. So now we're gonna have a graph. Well, what we noticed, there, what we notice is we stare at this. If we stare at this. See, how did mu get in there? Mu got in there because the expected rate of inflation, um, the expected rate of inflation is equal to the rate of money creation. Okay, so now look at the following. When you increase mu, you can check this time. When you increase mu, this piece goes up. But when you increase mu, this piece goes down. So I'm going to write this right-hand side as a function of mu. And there's going to be a race. As mu goes up, this term pulls it up and this term pulls it down. And what's going to happen is, if you do a little thinking, um, it looks like this. I'm, what I'm plotting here is, here is, here is the um, gross of interest deficit. And it, and it must be covered. That's what's on this axis the gross of interest deficits on this axis. Um, I'm plotting mu on this axis. And then what we're plotting in this curve here is mu, one plus mu, phi of this, okay. So um, essentially when mu is zero, um, well, um, you're, not raising, you're not printing any money and you're not raising any revenues. When mu is extremely high um, and people are holding when when mu is so high that the demand for money has gone way way down, you're not you're not raising very much in your revenues either because um, the way we can think about it is this is the inflation tax and this is the base. This whole thing's the base of the inflation tax. And what happens is as you raise the rate of inflation or the rate of money creation. Um, you raise the rate of uh, the tax, but you cause the base to shrink. So there's a race between the two. And under reasonable assumptions about the demand for money, the, um, it looks like this. As you increase the, the rate of inflation, um, at first, the revenues from money creation increase, but then they get to some level, they reach a peak, and then they start going down. So, so what you'll notice is this, this thing is called a Laffer curve. Because it's, it, it basically tells you there's, um, there's, there's actually, it tells you that there's two tax rates, this one and this one, that raise the same revenues, but one, has, one is a high tax rate, low base. The other is a lower tax rate, higher base. And um, many, many taxes that are distorting have, this feature that there's multiple rates that raise the same revenues. And we economists, we citizens usually like to say that um, life or nature or economics picks the lower one, picks the lower one. So we're going to concentrate on the lower one. We're going to say we're, and the way people say that the lower one is we're always on the correct side of the Laffer curve. We haven't raised taxes so high that, that uh, we could actually raise more revenues with a lower tax rate. We're saying we're on the correct side of the Laffer curve, a widely made assumption. So we're going to make that. And then that's our analysis. So, so okay, this is kind of the classic theory of inflation. Um, so let's say that you, and remember, this is our long run. This is t greater than or equal to one. So what this says is, look what this says is, if you increase g or decrease t, or you have a larger debt that you have to roll over, um, higher gross of interest deficits, like this, are going to have to be financed by higher mu's. So if you exogenously increase this, 
either by raising government expenditure, decreasing taxes, or somehow increasing the amount of debt that you have to finance that's inherited from the past. Remember Keynes's letter. We have, it's beautiful because we have everything in Keynes's letter. Um, if that is raised, you're going to have to increase mu. Another way to read this graph is if you want to lower mu, you're going to have to lower G or increase G or default on your debt. This is Keynes's letter and my copy of Keynes's letter in just one graph. It's all about the long run. Remember, this is all T greater than or equal one. So basically, we've actually gotten a lot from this little analysis. Um, so I urge you to go read that um, letter uh, from Keynes and uh, watch for these things to appear. And you know, the logic is ironclad. Um, it's all in this graph. Um, that intersection is what's determining. You see, when you do economic analysis, you're always free to flip what's determining and what's determined. If I take mu as exogenous, then something, if I say it's exogenous and fix it some number, then the only way this analysis is going to fit together if G minus T plus RB is equal to the amount dictated by that intersection. Or if I say those things are exogenous, G minus T plus RB, if that's exogenous, then inflation is determined, money creation is determined. There's no other choice, no other one thing that can happen. So that's the long run. So off from this nice equation. Um, that's the straight line. That's the curve. Okay. So now we're, we're going to um, go a little beyond to uh, what, what Keynes was talking about in the classical doctrine, and we're going to do something that my friend Neil Wallace and I called unpleasant monetarist arithmetic. Um, it's going to emphasize heavily the discrepancy between short run and long run. That's where we're going. Okay. So this is the monetarist arithmetic. We're going to have the short run and we're going to have the long run. And we're going to have some things that are given from the past. So we want to think of uh, today is time zero. Today is time zero. And what we're given from the past is some debt that we've inherited and it's index debt. Um, it's like inflation protected securities. And we're given the initial money supply, whatever we came into. And then here's what, here's the deal. There's going to be a fiscal authority. And what we think of the fiscal authority, that's the treasury in the United States and the president. Um, or we can think it's the Congress and the president. That's a fiscal authority. So the treasury is going to set government expenditures at time zero. That's short run. It's going to set government expenditures in the long run. It's going to set taxes in the short run. It's going to set taxes in the long run. You know, in other words, it's going to set all elements of the sequence of government expenditures and taxes, tax collections, and um, we've trimmed those sequences down just to, to a pair of numbers. Government expenditures today and tomorrow forever. Tax collections today and tomorrow forever. That's what we're going to do. And then the fiscal authority is going to do that, and it's, it's going to issue bonds. Uh, so it, we allow the fiscal authority to run deficits, and how and it runs deficits, it, it issues these one-period bonds, and they can be held. Now, who's going to own those bonds? I don't know if you watch if you watch the United States today, uh, the Fed and the financial markets, or you watch Europe. They can be held either by the private sector or by the monetary authority. And when we're the, when they end up with the private sector, we're going to call them B. Okay, that's the deal. So what, what's the monetary authority going to do? And this is true of real life monetary authorities. What they do is they do not set G0, G, T0, T. They don't set that. Um, but what they do is they conduct monetary policy. They trade in bond and money markets. They do open market operations. 
If they increase money in the hands of the public, they do it by decreasing bonds in the hands of the public. They do an open market exchange. They print money. They don't use the money directly to um, buy goods. They, they use it to, to buy bonds. Okay, that's our division of authority. Um, that's our quote unquote independent central bank convention. So we're being very precise about what the monetary authority does. Now, and we're gonna do an exercise about that. So then uh, the equilibrium of the model is gonna determine P0. The equilibrium of the model is gonna determine P0 and pi. So the, the inflation rate and the money creation rate are gonna be determined by, by the equilibrium. So this order matters. See, I'm not, I'm, and this is respecting the, uh, the budget constraint arithmetic that I gave you and Keynes's letter. You know, uh, Keynes's, Keynes's, the spirit of Keynes's letter is that pi, um, or, or mu, I guess we call it, we call it mu, mu, um, which is equal to the expected rate of inflation. Mu is an outcome. It's determined by these factors above. That's what his letter's saying. And that's what we're saying right here. Okay. So, so now we're gonna do an exercise. Um, and we're gonna put you in a situation where you're a decision maker. Um, and um, you're the monetary authority at time zero, at time zero. And you can do open market operations and that's all. And you have to take as given what the fiscal authority sets um, but you can do this. And you also have to take as given as um, you're not a dictator. The equilibrium, the competitive equilibrium, um, demand equals supply is going to determine P0 and mu. So here's the exercise. Suppose the goal of the monetary authority, you're given this by the president or the Congress, is to lower the price level P0. Now, that's stated very carefully. Lower the price level P0. I'm saying nothing about what happens to P1, P2, P3, just P0. You want to lower that. The question is, how should monetary policy be conducted? So do you want to increase the money supply or decrease the money supply at time zero, which you control via these open market operations? And do you want to do that? Um, subject to these stipulations that we put on. Okay, so suppose the goal is lower price level P0. That's our question. So let's do an exercise. Um, we're going to sell bonds. So the central bank is going to um, sell bonds from it, perhaps its portfolio. Central bank might own some bonds at times. It's going to sell them, or it's going to, which is going to decrease M zero, and it's going to increase the private sector's B. So when the central bank um, tightens monetary policy, it it automatically increases the stock of securities, um, government IOUs, which are in the hands of the public. That's an increase in B. So let's see what happens. Uh, what are the effects of an increase in B? So now we're gonna suspend intuition for a while. We're just gonna do the analysis. We're gonna do the analysis, let the graphs and the equations give us answers. Um, and then we'll go back and check our intuition later. But this stuff is sufficiently tricky that intuition um, will fail us if we skip too many steps. Okay, so here we are. That, there's a graph. Um, and we're going to ask what happens in the long run and in the short run. Well, there's a long run consequence of this open market operation at time zero, and it is an increase in B. Um, so we froze G, we froze T, but the open market operation increased B. Um, because remember, we're doing this uh, after time 
from time one on, the stock of B is fixed. It's inherited from whatever happened at time zero. So what our graph tells us is the effects of an increase in B or a decrease in M0 conducted by the open market operation, these are equivalent. The effect of that is to shift the gross of interest deficit up. Why? Well, the government, uh, the, open, the central bank has, has contracted the money supply by selling government bonds to the public. The public now owns more government bonds and the treasury is gonna to have to pay the interest rate on those bonds. Um, that higher level of government bonds. So that's increased the government deficit, gross of interest. So this graph goes up. And so what happens? Um, mu has to go up. So the inflation rate from time one on goes up. This is all, this is all implicit in Keynes's um, Keynes's letter. We're just kind of pulling this out and adding some some step by step rigor. Um, okay, so that's the effect of an increase in B. So if we sell bonds, which decreases M zero and increases private sector B, this requires an increase in future money growth rates, higher inflation, because the interest component of the gross of interest deficit is increased. And I must say that in some countries, um, the interest component, um, especially when real interest rates are fairly substantial, um, they're not now, but they were in the 1980s and much of the 90s. Um, these are substantial payments. Um, okay. So if you sell bonds, which decrease M0, you increase private sector B, and that has that ramifications on the fiscal deficit. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the short run. Okay. So in the short run, we have our budget constraint at time zero. That's all we have to look at. And um, we're gonna do this with a graph. Some, some fun things are gonna happen. Okay. So, um, well, M0 over P0, that was actually determined in the previous graph. Um, and actually we know what it is. M0 over P0 is just, is just this. That's our, that's our demand function for money. Um, at time zero, it only depends on, on the rate of money creation from time, you know, one on. So it's pinned down, this is pinned down. It's pinned down from our previous analysis. Why? Because mu was pinned down. So everything, now, everything is pinned down in this equation except for P0. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, why do I say that? Because, um, well, B is pinned down by the open market operation. M minus one was given. Uh, B0 is inherited from the past. Uh, these are untouchable, G0 and T0. So everything's pinned down. And now we can draw a graph. And the purpose of this graph is to determine the one thing we want to determine. See, remember we said equal, what do we say? Equilibrium determines mu and P0. Well, we already determined, we already determined mu from this analysis. So mu's pinned down. And now we're just working backwards. Now we have to determine P0, that's where we're going. That's the only thing that's up for grab. And by the way, that's what we were asked in the question, remember? We were asked this question, if you were a monetary authority and wanted to increase P0, what would you do at time zero? Would you increase the money supply or would you decrease the money supply? And forget your intuition. Use this analysis. Use Keynes' equations. Don't use intuition yet. Okay. So we can just rewrite this equation. That's the same equation. I just took something to the left hand side, took this to the other side. Okay, and now we're just gonna draw a graph. Our secret weapon here is just gonna be a graph. So I'm gonna graph 
m minus 1 over p0, and it's just equal to all this junk on the right-hand side. And let's see what it looks like. Um, well, this is a depiction of a downward sloping curve. Um, I'm, I'm drawing m minus 1 over p0 as a function of mu. Um, and where does mu enter? It enters uh, right here. So this is a downward sloping curve. Okay, so this equation is our time zero budget constraint. And it's got one free variable in it that hasn't been determined, it's P zero. Okay, so now, now what are we gonna do? Um, now we're gonna do our experiment. Um, that's great, there's our graph. Um, and, uh, and now we're gonna ask, See, what we've done here is beautiful. We've eliminated, we've actually eliminated M0. We eliminated M0. If you ask kind of, where did M0 go? Where is M0? Where did it go? Well, it said right here, M0 over P0 um, is determined. It's determined, and where was it determined? It was determined, um, oops. It was determined in our, I have to go back further. It was determined in this graph. Um, because once we determine mu, um, we determine M0 over P0. That's just equal to phi. I just plug in my Y and I plug in my R plus mu. So once you tell me mu, I know real balances at every day, including time zero because of the timing. Okay, so now, Here's what my graph's gonna look like. Um, changing M0, decreasing M0 is equivalent with increasing B. So the analysis that is this, gonna look like this. Uh, if I increase B, um, I increase mu, and, uh, but, so mu also appears here. Um, and, and so what's gonna happen is, um, this curve is actually going to um, shift in this direction. Um, so why does it increase in this direction? Uh, because B is increased, B is shifted out. So if I increase B, it shifts this curve up, shifts this curve up, and drives mu upward. So, so M minus one over P zero was initially here. And after, after uh, that, after, after the decrease in M zero and the increase in B, it's here. Uh, now, so now the question we ask is, is M minus one over P zero, has it risen or has it fallen? And, the answer is, well, you have to know more than we said. It all depends on the, the slope. Depends on the slope of the demand function for money. Um, if the demand function for money has a, has a really big slope, it could actually, see, if, if I drew this like this, this could be like this. It could like that. If, it was, if the demand function for money was more sloped like that, it could happen that M, M minus one over P zero could actually go down. And if it went down, it would mean that P zero would actually go up. So what's gonna happen to P zero? Or another way, what's gonna happen to M minus one over P zero depends entirely now on the slope of the demand for money. And um, something strange can happen. Um, so, Actually, that, there we go. So an increase in, in uh, future money growth causes higher inflation because the interest component of the government debt has increased. The policy may or may not reduce P0 depending on how much the demand for money falls. If it falls enough because of the increase, the price level can actually go up. So what that means is in that weird case, if I increase if I actually, um, if I actually uh, 
decrease real balances and increase B, it can actually happen that the price level actually actually goes up. So this is a case, this is the extremely unpleasant monetarist, you could say, or Keynesian, because it is Keynes's arithmetic, that um, that with a fiscal policy that's that's determined, namely government expenditures and taxes locked down, and a, a government debt, B0, that you can't adjust, um, you have to honor, then um, an open market operation that decreases the money supply. Well, the first thing is, you know, automatically it's going to increase the inflation in the long run, meaning next period, and it may actually increase the price level today. So to many people that was counterintuitive because you, you think, um, you just, you just think, you might just think, uh, well, the reason it's counterintuitive is that logic was, MT over PT equals phi, Y, well, if that's fixed, if YT is fixed, um, and then I take R is fixed and pi TE, um, the logic would be if pi TE was fixed, it was fixed, then if I increase M or decrease M, it's gonna increase P. But this whole thing is, the stuff on the right hand side is not fixed. This may be fixed, this may be fixed, but pi TE is changing. Um, and so that's, that's logic. So that's the unpleasant um, monitor's arithmetic. Um, and, um, and it may seem, if it seems counterintuitive, um, oops, it's, um, It's, uh, that's because our intuition was derived totally from a static analysis. And when we, when we remember that it's, we have to take count of the dynamics and distinguish between the short term and the long term. And um, we get this intriguing result. So um, that's our analysis of unpleasant arithmetic. And I, I prefer to view it as a, an extension and really implication of uh, of Keynes's very nice letter, which I which I commend to you. Thank you.